Hi, this is Bill Arnold. Missed a show or need me talking to help you sleep tonight? I have several solutions to that situation. Here are the podcasts from the show. You are the best for listening and supporting Faith Radio. Welcome to Afternoons with me. I'm Bill Arnold. I'm going to have a wonderful hour with Todd and Laura Mullick, and they're here in studio. Todd's a counselor and author and a speaker on marriage and families. It's kind of a marriage and family day today, a little bit, with the exception of uh, Rob Bluey at the opening of the show. Uh, we just had Ron Deal. If you missed any of it, you might want to go and hear about that in terms of blended families. But uh, Todd is going to talk today. We're going to talk about a very difficult subject to get things started, and that is how to walk along side a spouse or a family member who has mental health issues and uh, we're awfully glad to be able to address that topic uh, with a counselor like Todd and his wife Laura welcome both of you thank you so much Bill Thanks. so how do we start this discussion well I think we have to normalize the fact that especially we've learned during COVID the amounts of folks that normally battle mental health issues has even become more. So we have a 50% increase in people that have battled anxiety, a 44% increase in people that battle depression. And those are the two most common mental health issues in the world. Uh, Both anxiety and depression are the most common. So I, I think it's, I'm always seeing in my office, Bill, folks that are battling with, you know, how can I support this person who, my spouse or family member that is really struggling with depression or anxiety? How do I walk alongside that? How do I be a Christ follower in that? And then also I'm hearing from people that battle the mental health issue, how do I navigate my boundaries with my spouse or how do I tell them what I need or and it's just hard you know and so I think it's good to talk through that a little bit and I thought it'd be just great to have my wife Laura come in, my wife of 33 years, Laura, <laughs> come in and talk first just about her journey with depression and what that's been like for her and maybe have her speak to a little bit about what people need that are actually going through it. What do they need from their spouse or a family member that's most helpful? And then maybe uh, we can go from there. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to hear, Laura, your story. I um, grew up in a Christian family, loved Jesus, followed Jesus, uh, but never really talked a whole lot about emotions. Mm-hmm. Like we said, happy once a year when it was Easter, you know, <laughs> we just kind of didn't um, emote much or um, you think about things, you don't feel things. It doesn't really matter how we feel about things. So I was kind of conditioned not to really be too in tune with my emotions or my feelings. And when uh, we had our third child and I was about to, I was kind of in the process of stopping breastfeeding my third. And I remember as clear as a bell, we were out at a restaurant with uh, a man who was our best. He was in our, our wedding party and just a great single guy. And I'm sitting in the restaurant with Todd, the three girls and our friend Davey. And I am watching these two manly men of God (laughs) love my girls so well. And out of the blue, I started to cry. And I thought, this is weird. It's not like me (laughs) at all. And um, I subsequently kind of unpacked that with Todd. And I said, I just feel so overwhelmed in this moment um, I'm I'm happy, but I'm sad at the same time. And come to find out uh, after a check-in with my physician, I was experiencing postpartum depression, but I didn't recognize it because it hadn't happened right after we had the our third daughter. And uh, that began a journey of trying to figure out how to navigate this mental health piece. Um, I would say generationally, there it's been present, but never really acknowledged in my family of origin. And uh, Todd and and our church family, our small group, came around me in ways that were really life giving, and we can unpack that a little bit. Can I ask a question, Laura? Of course. When you saw Todd and Davy mm-hmm. loving on your girls, yeah, were you responding to what you didn't receive? 
Like, oh. look at the way they're treating mm-hmm. my girls. This didn't happen to me. That's a great I, I would have loved for of it. Question. Love for it to happen to me, but it didn't. That oh. is a great question and one I have never contemplated in all of these years. Okay. <laughs> I think because I... Because I heard the no emotion yeah. mm-hmm. and all of yeah. a sudden Todd and Davey are pouring out love and emotion on yep. these girls and you're thinking, <laughs> what did I miss? Yeah, there was just... I, and I was loved by my parents. Right. They just didn't know how to show it, I think, in some ways. And in in that moment, I just felt so overwhelmed with gratitude that God was going to have these Christian influences surround my girls and and model for them what they should look for in relationships in years to come. Um, yeah, that's a great question, Bill. I'll have to ponder that one, get back to you. So as the depression was navigating itself and you were working through it, what, what are a couple of things you can help kind of the audience know mm. what that was like for you? Um, like I said, I, I didn't really uh, know how to recognize uh, my emotions very well because we, I was raised really pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and you always do the next right thing. Um, which is great and beneficial and good. And it doesn't uh, help you paint a full picture of how to live life to the fullest, Mm. right? And I would also say in our relationship, Todd is really heavy on grace, and I am more a truth teller, right? So, um, and the logic versus the feelings, those kinds of things to navigate. So, for him to ask me how I was feeling felt like, um, and he didn't intend it in that way, but I, I can remember feeling like he's putting something mm-hmm. on me mm-hmm. or asking me to do something that I don't know how to do. Like I'm already having suicidal ideation at that point, And for me to have to unpack or figure out how to f- how I'm feeling felt really heavy mm-hmm. in those moments. Um Thankfully, he's patient and kind and gracious, and uh, we figured out different language, I think. But that's something that people need to be aware of, um, is um, kind of thinking through. I I would say I used to be really good at sympathy prior to experiencing depression. Now I'm better at empathy, Um, kind of trying to take the perspective of others. Does that make sense? It does to me. Um, I'm thinking, too, Laura, when you talk about this um, empathy in your family, everything was going to be okay, right? Yep. So pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But what if you stub your toe or you skin your knee and you know in your heart you're going to be fine and it's going to heal, but you just want to be held for an extra two minutes? Mm -hmm. And that's all. (laughs) Yep. And if the only message was you're going to be fine and (laughs) pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that hurts. It does. Um, And when you're raised in that kind of a family system, I think you, you just know it as your normal. So you, you, it's like a fish in water, right? You Mm -hmm. don't, it it doesn't recognize that it's swimming in water because that is the environment that it lives in. Um, So I've had to relearn some of those things. And I would also say Todd and I, by the grace of God, right? Uh, we have broken generational patterns and generational sin, even. Um, not that we did anything perfectly. Our girls could testify to that. <laughs> but we've got them in the we, other room right now. Come on, <laughs> girls. Hey. But Thanks we for have sharing, Bill. broken some of those patterns <laughs> oh. and those sin patterns of generations so that they are now equipped to do it a step better than we were raised. And hopefully they'll carry that trajectory forward. What do you think are, is something that you would say that? Uh, you you have needed the most, um, whether I've been able to do that well or not. What do, what do you think somebody that's battling, especially mm. as you know, depression is very episodic, so it doesn't mean the person who has depression is always depressed, but it, it, it comes in episodes. And so when the episode gets loud, it's so loud that nothing, it's just a fog, it's overwhelming, there's excessive guilt, there's feelings of hopelessness, you know, all of that. So what do you think is most mm. helpful? One of the 
things I would suggest people think about if they if they're battling it doesn't have to be just depression it might be bipolar episodes or other kinds of mental health struggles Mm -hmm. anxiety perhaps um i think to have safe spaces to have conversations to talk through or think through how i might respond in the future when that depression has me bottom out again um I believe in the power of prayer. I also believe that God has given us uh, medications Mm. uh, and relationships and the body of Christ to be supports in those times. But I think when I'm in my right rational mind to think through what I, how I might respond if that seasonal depression kicks in again can be really beneficial. Right. Talking about it ahead of time as yep. a couple. So when the depression gets loud, we know this is to be most helpful. I guess I've noticed, you know, as your spouse, like the, one of the things that I work really hard at is trying not to fix it. Amen. <laughs> or trying not to, you know, work you through it or hear yes. some plans, you know, just shut up, Todd, and take a breath <laughs> and let the Holy Spirit be your advocate. and your Because the person who's a caregiver with somebody that's dealing with mental health issues, that can be hard, overwhelming too. So you just want to love and walk. So the key, I think, is to validate what your spouse mm-hmm. is experiencing, right, whether depression is loud or quiet, and to walk alongside and not to try to fix it. Yes. What would you say to that? I think that's very true. And it kind of harkens back to what Bill mentioned before Mm -hmm. as well. Like sometimes you just need the presence of another person, Mm -hmm. right? Or to be held maybe if that's how you're wired. Um, Todd's far more snuggly than I am actually. (laughs) But it is really beneficial to have that uh, human contact. And I think people, that's partly why I think maybe we've seen some of the spikes that Todd was talking about earlier in depression and anxiety. We've lost physical connection in this last year. Um, and that, that can be a real challenge. So, yeah, mm-hmm. but I, nobody likes to feel like somebody's project. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We take a little break. Todd and Laura Mulliken are my guests. We're talking about uh, depression and how to walk alongside someone that you love and know and care about as they're going through it. We'll be right back. And Laura Mulliken, you know Todd from uh, ToddMulliken.com. We're talking about walking alongside a spouse or a family member who has mental health issues. And his wife, Laura, is nice enough and kind enough to be vulnerable to share some of her journey. And I just had a, a dear, dear listener say, I've experienced depression. And what Laura is describing makes me think of when I see others being able to enjoy other people. You wonder why you cannot. And the tears come from why aren't I normal? Mm. Uh, That is so well stated. I remember when I was first on the journey of trying to figure out um, medication or therapy or uh, how is this going to work? And I ended up having a back injury at the same time as I was wrestling through depression and just coming to recognize it. And we were part of a covenant group of young couples all raising kids together. And they came and were Jesus with skin on to myself, to Todd, and to our three girls. They swooped it. I mean, just came in, scooped us up mm-hmm. as a family, allowed Todd to continue working. My my back was such that I couldn't ca- lift our daughters at that time. And they came in and held my baby when I couldn't. Um, they made meals. They scrubbed our bathroom within an inch of its life. Um, just took care of us. But I also remember going out to lunch with them um, a couple months into that process 
And the church, we're supposed to be the body for one another. And these loving, dear friends decided to treat me out to lunch one day. And we went out. But this was a couple months in. And and I think we can be impatient. Like we, we expect things to get better or yeah. or get a quick fix, or if I'm on the road to recovery, I should be done now, right? And we're all good. And I think it had been a long journey for them watching me really wrestle with trying to adapt to medication or therapy or whatever. And as we sat at that lunch table in the sunshine, it felt as though well-intentioned, I'm certain, these dear friends proceeded to kind of go around the table and come up with solutions for me. And I felt very much like a project or something broken to be fixed at that time. And um, I I just think, I, I talk with teens or hurting difficult life situation people all the time in my day job. And I often tell people, instead of asking people, what is wrong with you? Ask what happened to you? Um, and I think that's that's been a huge learning for our whole family, honestly. I think our kids are wired that way better now, too. So I understand when this woman says, I just, I sit there and I I wish I could feel those joyful emotions in that moment when I'm in the depths of darkness. Um, But the truth is I I can't, but I have hope that that will come again. I have hope in Jesus that even though I might not be fully healed in this lifetime, I know that I will be healed at the resurrection completely and fully. And in the meantime, Gosh, God is good, and he is faithful, and he is present, ever, ever present. So well said. And I think it's, I think as a church, Bill, I know when I was giving talks on anxiety maybe 25, 30 years ago, sometimes people would think it's if we just don't worry, (laughs) or, you know, if we worry, we don't have enough faith, or it's it's more like just, just fix this. Uh, and then we're set versus understanding that mental health issues are, are very similar to physical health issues, right? Where some last uh, a very short period of time and it's healed fairly quickly because it's a very mild condition. Other people have very severe cases where it could be a lifelong kind of journey and process of some really great transformative moments and some really difficult wilderness times. And I think we just need to have understanding of how to not fix that but walk alongside have compassion versus getting codependent on the reactions and trying to feel like we have to take something on and fix it. So how do we get to validate what our spouse or family member is going through? And and maybe a couple of questions we can ask. What would you say, honey? A couple of questions like I could ask you and mm. that are helpful questions to ask. Oh, I think it's so dependent on who the individual is. Mm-hmm. I I know after 33 years into mm-hmm. marriage right. <laughs> that you do have my best interest at heart, that you're not prying when you say, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, but I think also for me as a thinker and versus a feeler, you've learned like, so what are you thinking about how how things are going this season versus asking me even how I'm feeling um, can be really beneficial. But again, that's dependent on how people are wired. So knowing the uniqueness Um, of your spouse, right, and how they're wired and how to walk alongside. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So I think it's a journey, not a moment, and that's just helpful stuff for folks. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing I think it would be good to deal with, though, Bill, too, is that how do we walk alongside a situation when our spouse or family member isn't acknowledging the the severe issues they have, you know, especially in the areas of depression or really crippling anxiety. I remember playing tennis with a friend of mine years and years and years ago, and he had a difficult, uh, he he had a call from his spouse and his spouse um, said, you know, you guys got to stop playing tennis until our son gets there. And um, so that's what he told me. His wife said to him over the phone and he just got really poor 
body, you know, he just is his nonverbals where he just, I could tell he's really sad. And I said, what's going on? He said, well, I just worry because my spouse worries so much. I mean, my, my boy is 15 years old and he's two blocks away and I'm just not worried. I think he'll be okay. But how do I tell her that I'm not worried, but I know she worries, but I know that her worry has been causing a lot of overprotection in the family. And how do I deal with that? Mm -hmm. So I told him, I said, I don't want to give you advice. Call him Joe. I don't want to give you advice. I just want to. Especially because I'm winning right now. One of the rare times. He played tennis at Stanford, so okay, truth so be you told, were I was losing. <laughs> just, I appreciated the phone call. gave me a break. Right? So anyway, he, he said, you know, I don't know what to do. I said, well, I guess I would just walk alongside her and be honest and say, honey, I love you and I'm for you. And, but, uh, and I know you're really worried, but I'm just letting you know in that moment I wasn't worried about our son, but I know you were. And so I understand that. But I, I get worried about your worry, and I want to talk more about that. So that's what I told him to do. Mm-hmm. He sends me a text a week later. That was the worst advice you ever gave. <laughs> <laughs> because it didn't go well, right? Yeah. You know, because it didn't go well. But what it helped him to do is just to learn how to come toward her and be honest about what he was experiencing versus staying passive and letting that untreated anxiety really control the family, if you will. So when her anxiety was loud, it was really controlling, and the kids were getting really frustrated. So it, it helped them get into the game, if you will, in Jesus to say, hey, how do we have honest conversations and address these mental health issues that are there? Mm-hmm. So I think it's really tricky, but just a couple of thoughts. I think the first thing to do is just really be honest with your spouse. If if you see like, hey, their father had crippling depression and now you're in a depressive episode, honey, I'm worried. This is what I'm seeing, but what do you think? So create an honest conversation is one key. And the honest conversation puts stuff on the table for fu- future conversations, and let the, let them in about how this is ex- how you're being affected by it. But that I love you and I'm for you. But this is what I'm seeing. What do you think? So it's about creating volleys, but creating honest conversations. So Todd, I want to ask after the break if people have got this anxiety or some of this mental health issues, uh, what are the odds that they're going to come forward and say? Yeah, I, I think I really am struggling. I need help. And if they're not doing that, how much are you walking on eggshells? And that's got to be no fun. Todd Mullican and Laura are, uh, Mullican are in studio right now. We're talking about coming alongside people who self, suffer from mental health uh, issues and, and depression in, in general um, and anxiety. So we're going to take a break and we come back. If you have a question or comment, please let me know what it is. I'd love to hear from you. 877 933 84 again 8779332484 be right back back with Todd and Laura Mulliken. We're talking about a mental health issues and depression and how to walk alongside a spouse or a family member who has it. And Laura has been uh, lovely in her description of her journey with depression. And Todd, you seem to ask all the right questions. So, I mean, you're doing your job as the counselor. This is perfect. But not admitting to your, your problem, I would think that would be a very big challenge. And then you're walking on eggshells. If someone doesn't say, you know, I've got raging anxiety, help me do something about this. Yeah. Or depression, help me. Cal, such a great question because the norm is to not acknowledge the issue because once we acknowledge the issue, then we have to really take it on or we have to really deal with it. And sadly, the more severe the mental health issue, usually the more unlikely it is that they will acknowledge. And, um, 
even get a, a bit frustrated or mildly paranoid if their spouse is coming towards with even a very gentle volley. So I find myself saying quite a bit to the the spouse who's in my office saying, how do I address this issue? I will say, well, you get to have compassion versus being codependent. So you get to put your shoes on, stop walking on glass and be content in your um, intention in Jesus versus defined by their reaction. So codependent people tend to be defined by the reaction of, of their spouse about that issue versus knowing, like, I, I know my intention is pure. I've done James 4. I understand my motives here. I'm bringing it toward. And that's the best I can do is let them in to my concern about their worry, my concern about the deep sadness. Uh, the best I can do is get it on the table now as an honest conversation. So now at least Bill, it's on the table so that we can readdress it the next time the anxiety gets loud. I mean, if it's more severe, are they even able to admit it? Usually not. Yeah. Okay, so then we're going more deeply to, um, you know, you go anywhere from continuing the conversation, uh, a 16-year-old comes in and shares their feelings towards their parent, you know, the 25-year-old who's out of the house comes back and says, you know, this is what I've been dealing with too, not as a pile on, but a walk alongside. And that can be sometimes a moment can really be transformative and the person just has that moment of vulnerability where they really get it. Other times it takes, you know, uh, you know, a more of a, a mild, if you will, intervention. But more often than not, Bill, it's just a slow process of seeing if they can get in together for counseling. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I've had that mental health issue person in my office along with their spouse who has finally got them in, and we navigate the water slowly until they get comfortable with acknowledging you know, the fact that they have this issue. So again, it really depends. Yeah. And the whole thing is a family dynamic, isn't it? It is. It creates dynamics within the whole system. Yeah. I mean, you got a a sibling that might think that the brother or sister is occupying all the oxygen in the house because of their condition and they're getting resentful. I mean, there's a lot of things to consider here, isn't there? There is. Yep. Each person needs to be able to, and that's why I, I do think I find myself saying to the parents, look, here's how this is impacting your kids how do you know their own uniqueness now and come towards them with, hey, mom and dad are struggling, but here's what we're working on. How, and then ideally the person who has a mental health issue who now has opened, opened the door a little bit, they're saying, how are you doing with this? This is what I'm experiencing. How are you feeling? Is there anything you need? So, but a lot of that takes family counseling settings and openness to, to at least them acknowledging that there's an issue. So, Again, sometimes you see a crack right away, Bill, where it's just a, a situation that the person really breaks and feels like I've got to share. Other times it's honest conversations over a decade, you know, so it really depends on the situation. But I do think honesty today prevents problems tomorrow. So I don't think it works to just get into wishful thinking, avoidance, avoid, 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 and it'll go away. I think address versus avoid. Not address every five minutes, but address and let them in and do it the very best you can with good intentions. Because now we're starting the conversation, and that's the only way we got a chance of changing that generational pattern mm-hmm. is to address the mess. If you just jumped in your car, Todd and Laura Mulliken are my guests. We're talking about walking alongside someone who has mental health issues and depression. And Laura, I've been a little haunted since you had mentioned this lovely lunch you had outside with your uh, lady friends, and they all sort of took turns suggesting uh, what you might do to get yourself out of the funk you were in. And I thought, boy, I bet I've done that as well. Made suggestions as to how you might get fixed. (laughs) (laughs) Note to self, that wasn't helpful. I think that is, that can be really painful to be on the receiving end. Um, I, and I know that I probably too have, have done that, uh, unintentionally. Right. I think we're so wired to, and, and as believers, we're so wired to see change, redemption, restoration. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge, like so many of your guests that come on, talk about how change happens over time or growth happens over time. And we are in such an instant gratification you know, I want it now. I want to order it and have it in my house in 12 mm-hmm. hours right. kind of a thing. 
And and this can be a long journey for people, much like grief, right? It, it's it's a long walk in a direction toward Jesus um, over time. So for the church to be supportive of the whole family, like we had a church family who loved our kids really well. And as I, you know, came forward like 10 years and would struggle less often with depressional episodes. I also knew that we had trusted adult Christians in our kids' lives that they could ask questions or go to or call on. Um, I think that's really important to to not have just this cone of silence around mental health issues within families, because that's a generational pattern that I saw a lot growing up. If there was any kind of abuse, adultery, addiction, mental health issues, you just kind of closed the doors and nobody outside of your immediate circle of the family Mm -hmm. could be privy to that. And really were created in God's image as relational beings. And I think part of that relational being is reflected in our relationships with those in the body of Christ. And that's supportive, not shaming or hurtful. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Does that resonate? Yeah, Mm -hmm. big time. Yeah, and I think all it does when we do that is it exacerbates the stigma of mental health, mm-hmm. you know, by keeping yeah. it closed versus normalizing and validating, like, it's okay. You know, God is with mm-hmm. us in that. Why did Jesus say, fear not, do not be afraid more than anything else in the scriptures? He knows that we worry. He knows that we mm-hmm. struggle. Uh, so I think it's what you're saying is so great, honey, about just not keeping that closed in, but having trusted people and sharing that and then walking alongside each other in, in the journey really important and then then the generation then the generational patterns really change over time and that's the gift that we get to give to the children too bill is as the couple is acknowledging the mental health issues versus we don't talk about that here maybe we just go to church and we don't talk about heart stuff no we go to church because we we need a savior because we need to be redeemed because we're broken Mm -hmm. and we have hard stuff and we get to address that so you know, I'm encouraged that, you know, I started counseling in 1984, Bill, and now it's 2021. And I do think overall people are much more receptive to understanding mental health issues in the body than we when it used to be. So mm-hmm. I think we're getting there. Yeah. What if a family member has started to isolate and withdraws and all of a sudden you can't seem to get in touch with that person? They kind of stop coming to events and they've just pushed the family aside. So this is maybe an extended family member who doesn't live under the same yeah, roof, if exactly. I understand yeah. the question yeah. correctly. I, you know what? We all carry these little mobile devices with us 24-7. I have found that just texting on not a stalking basis, but a regular basis is really helpful because when that individual does want to come back to the family fold or wants to connect, they will remember that kindness that even when they weren't ready to talk on the phone or meet face to face, you remembered them. You thought of them. You sent them a text that you were praying for them. I think that is a powerful ministry mm-hmm. tool for as much of it as it's the bane of my existence many days. <laughs> <laughs> it is a powerful ministry tool to just remind people that they are loved and that they are seen and valuable. Yeah, that's really huge, really huge. And you're you're showing empathy versus fixing. Yeah. Right? You're, you're not sending the text, you know, here's the two things I see wrong and <laughs> here's what we need to work on. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're, you're sending a really loving text that's landing well, probably because they can see that your intention is pure and good. You're not trying to create, you're not trying to create a situation where you're trying to fix it right there. Mm-hmm. And, and I would say too, if this isn't uh, a family member if, if they're not maybe willing to come to extended family gatherings, say a holiday, there can be a lot of pressures around holiday mm-hmm. things, especially if you're feeling stigmatized maybe with mental health things or addiction issues. And so try and throw out an invitation for a smaller uh, thing, maybe a coffee, or is there something you need? Can I bring you groceries this week? 
um, is there, you know, do you need a Target gift card? <laughs> Are you out of toilet paper? How many times have we delivered toilet paper to people in the beginning of the pandemic? Because mm-hmm. nobody could find it, right? <laughs> but that was a loving gesture at it one was. point in our history. So um, I think maybe those smaller invitations mm-hmm. where you hopefully take some of the pressure off of them might be helpful. I like that. Yeah, more often than that, they're going into their places because they're really struggling life is overwhelming for them and they may there's a 50 percent chance at least they have some kind of mental health issue that's overwhelming them that they're stuck in so again that walking alongside you know feeding feeding them emotionally and spiritually is a great first move to to be jesus with you know the the skin and in the hand of jesus right there Mm -hmm. But, but we just want to go and find the solution and we just think we're being helpful there and just empathy always works, right? So if I can, if I've gone through that myself, then I know like, okay, that's not what's going to be helpful. But if people have, like your friends probably hadn't gone through some of that themselves or weren't aware that they were or whatever, they just didn't know what to do. Yeah. So that's why it's nice to have venues like this where we can share about here's really what people need the most. Very interesting. We'll take a little break. Todd and Laura Mulliken are our guests and we are chatting about how to come alongside someone that's suffering from mental health issues, maybe some depression, maybe some anxiety, and how important it is to uh, show up and love them um, and be patient and play the long game. Sounds like that's an important element in all of this. We'll take your questions or comments, 877-933-2484. Be right back. Todd and Laura Mulliken, so nice to have you both in here at the same time. Mm-hmm. I, I found out Todd's a cuddler today. So. <laughs> <laughs> True statement. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of disturbing. But anyway. <laughs> oh, so good. <laughs> um, uh, let's talk uh, about some of the uh, some of the things that create this mental illness. You, we talked about nature and nurture during the break, so maybe mm-hmm. we could talk about that some more. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we've learned quite a bit about mental health issues, Bill, and the root causes. And typically there is a a genetic component to it, typically, where there's a bit of a predisposition to it. We've even learned that PTSD um, has, is not just what we call a social construct only. In other words, if 10 people are exposed to the same trauma, not every one of those will have PTSD afterwards. You know, a handful of them will, and some of that will be that initial bodily reaction to it due to their brain chemistry and their hardware. But then the nurture piece is the environmental uh, situations that they're involved in. So for for Laura, the family system issues and just the dynamics within the family created a chronic stress that elongated the mental health concerns. So we have those nature and nurture issues that are going on. And that's why a lot of research talks about now these five main areas that we all get to pursue in trying to navigate through mental health issues. And it's not meant to say, hey, do these five things when we're all set. These are just five things that can help. Mm -hmm. And we call them the quote unquote wild five. The wild five, wild stands for wellness intervention for life demand. So the idea there is what can we do as Christ followers to address the mental health issues we have? And the first one is sleep optimization. So the more we've learned more and more, the the most, most we can do is really learn how to optimize the sleep we get. Um, When you're in a depressive episode, you either are oversleeping or undersleeping. That's a big problem. Some people that get depressed sleep 12 to 14 hours a day. Some people just can't fall asleep. And that's going to really give them emotional struggles and make their depression louder. Same way with anxiety. People that have anxiety wake up at 2 in the morning and have a hard time going back to sleep. And it's really hard. So we've got to do the best we can to create patterns of sleep optimization for ourselves. The next one is nutrition. So we've learned a lot about nutrition and what makes our bodies react well to healthy nutrients in our bodies. And we can go on and on about what that is, but we're for a healthy diet and having healthy nutrition is the second thing. 
Another thing is um, the idea of mindfulness, and for us as Christians, prayer. You know, so are you and I creating times in our life every day where we got a practice of prayer, our quiet time where we're letting the Holy Spirit in, receiving the spirit of truth and advocating on our behalf and going to him as our wise counselor, knowing as Jesus loves us that how are we letting him walk alongside us through this time? So are we creating that spiritual practice of regular prayer? And research has shown that that can really be a helpful piece in managing generalized anxiety, not as a cure, but a, a really nice pattern that that helps a lot. So I would say those are, you know, three of the of the loudest things that really help is that intentionality of good sleep, the intentionality of healthy diet, and the intentionality of good prayer and practicing that as well. So we're learning that there's different things that can really help. And, of course, medicine is another thing that we talk about. It's another key piece. It's like some people believe very strongly in medicine. Some people have had horrible experiences with medication, and so it's not one size fits all. Some people have supplements that help a lot. So clearly research will show you that some people really respond well to certain medicines. Some people don't respond well. Some people respond very well to certain supplements. Some people don't. So I think we want to be very open to the idea that what is God using for this particular person to help them in their story and help them create a a place to heal and to transform their life over time. Anything you've noticed, honey, with the managing of depression that is another thing that helps? You know, one of the things that I was wrestling with uh, a couple years into having recognized uh, that I was wrestling with depression on a pretty regular annual seasonal basis, I had a pastor that I felt very safe and comfortable going to. And he allowed me space to wrestle theologically with being on medication or not being on medication. Um, Because I, I look at, you know, Elijah, I'm pretty sure the guy was bipolar. I mean, he's up on the top of the mountain chop, <laughs> slaughters a bunch of prophets, and then outruns a chariot. And then the next time we see him, he's out in the desert saying, why am I the only one left, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like top to bottom, bipolar. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, right? I'm pretty sure he wrestled with depression. Those guys didn't have pharmaceuticals. <laughs> um and so I, he was, a, this pastor from our church was a gift to me because he allowed me the space to wrestle through theologically, whether it's a good idea to engage with medication or supplements or not, or should I be able to pray this away? Um, I, I couldn't. And I felt like I had faith and responded, but kind of landed with Paul and the thorn of the flesh, Right. Um, I think depression has been my thorn of the flesh, but it also has stopped me from being too prideful, right? <laughs> like, uh, like I say, I've learned le- lessons in empathy, um, but having safe spaces to kind of mm-hmm. wrestle even theologically with our mental health issues um, and faith and prayer and the prayer of a righteous man and being anointed with oil. And how does that really work out in real life with besetting situations? I think sometimes, um, like I said, we have the hope of all healing in heaven. Um, D-Day has happened and Jesus has marked the line in the sand that the victory Mm -hmm. is his, but V-Day won't come till he comes back. So in the meantime, I think we're engaged in the war of a sinful world. And this is one of the outcomes. I, I, my personal view is that mental health issues are a result of the fall. And yeah, that that's part of the mess that we live in. A couple of the other um, things that we were talking about you know, that are in that wild five. Another one that you mentioned earlier, honey, is that Mm -hmm. social connection piece Mm -hmm. is we're learning that isolation is not helpful for any mental health concern. And the social connectivity for the introvert isn't like having 20 people over four times a week. It's more that one-on-one, and you've seen that, right, hun, is more of an introvert, that one-on-one time of deep, you know, you know, 
deep conversation, good time together, just breaking bread. For me as an extrovert, it's been more the better, getting more connection with more people. So social connectivity would be the fourth of those five. And the fifth, of course, I remember about oh, 30 years ago or so, whenever, cause I'm really old now, but like, when do they use transparencies at con- uh, yeah. conferences? <laughs> so anyway, so one of the first conferences I went to, you know, Green back in the day, you know, like you said with your first guest, you know, you were in high school, right? With the Dead in yeah. 9-11. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right, the time. Yeah. 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 yeah, I keep thinking that. Yeah, it's great. So anyway, when I was, well, however old I was, I was at one of the first conferences and the guy said, hey, and this is a conference that was rolling out all the new medications and new um, ways that we can help with mental health issues, whatever, you know, just different approaches. And this person said, and here, I'm going to write on the transparency thing before he presses a button. Here is the most effective antidepressant of this year, 1995 or whatever. And he clicked on and it said exercise. Mm -hmm. So the last piece, I think, is how are you and I doing with having some type of regular exercise movement? And we're noticing whether it's a building up of endorphins and helping manage some of that serotonin depletion we have with depression, whatever it is. We're really attacking it with regular rhythms of, you know, any type of exercise that we're finding really important. So we're for all five of those areas, right? We're mm-hmm. for pursuing all of those in Jesus and getting after that in our recovery. So if you're with a friend at lunch and that comes up, mm-hmm. uh, the five things you just talked about, I don't think you're trying to fix anybody. You're just no? having conversation, right? Yeah, just letting them in to, hey, this is something I've been learning. Ideally, this is something I've been, you know, like for me, I struggle with some anxiety sometimes. So, I, you know, I can either let Laura in, God, I find myself really worrying about this one issue, or I can take it out on her and just be crabby or be avoidant. <laughs> or, you know, so how am I letting her in to what I'm experiencing, which is what I would say is a key per thing takeaway for the people that are struggling with the mental health issues. How are you letting your spouse into what you're experiencing? I just had 70 text messages come in. Laura, would you please describe Krabby Todd? (laughs) That's a lot of text messages. (laughs) What is it like when Todd's Krabby? Well, Todd is pretty even keeled as a person. And so if he gets short, it's noticeable because he just doesn't do that very often. But I think that's really a good, uh, good learning for other people people that we're talking about, like couples or family members or friends that are coming together that are struggling with mental health issues, be cognizant of the other person's wiring, Mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, Because like you say, anxiety and you kind of get crabby. For me, depression, it sometimes comes up as it, it bubbles up as anger out of nowhere sometimes. And so if we know that about ourselves or we know that about each other, we can kind of lean into that like, oh, uh, you kind of snapped at me there, Laura. Uh, what's going on? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And if I can do my part and not be defensive in that response, I yeah. can apologize for my part or own my part and then we can move yeah. forward. Laura, thank you for your vulnerability t- oh. today. It's been really nice having you here. And Todd, thank you so much as well. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it so much. Todd and Laura Mulliken have been my guests. You can always go over to Todd's website, toddmulliken.com. You spell his last name M-U-L-L-I-K-E-N. Mulliken, toddmulliken.com. Learn more about his counseling and his services and his speaking and all of that. So that wraps up our show for the day. I've loved uh, the longer weekend, but it's been great being back with you. I thought about you over the weekend, and I hope you had a great relaxing time over the weekend. And now we're back with a a week and i'm excited to spend uh, this time with you thanks for um, tuning in thank you for supporting faith radio i look forward already to, to tomorrow we're going to have jay warner wallace on and then daryl b harrison is going to be with us on our um, old testament series with dr peter capster and i that's all tomorrow have a great night everyone see you soon Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.